It is with pleasure that I introduce Aria Gallus, artist, professor emeritus at Soka University, and a most valued colleague to me and so many others. Gallus has dedicated his life to family, art, and teaching. This accumulation of years dedicated to a studio practice is no small feat. As artists, we understand there are good days and bad days, acceptances and rejections, but in the end, it is only through a wholehearted dedication year after year that a body of work can meaningfully evolve. Gallus will be discussing here in depth his reflected light work and will expand on materials, processes, content, and inspiration for this series. Gallus has exhibited work locally, nationally, and internationally. The Reflected Light series were initially exhibited at the O.K. Harris Gallery in New York City, a very famous gallery, mind you, and many of the works from the series are held in public and private collections. Please join me in welcoming my friend, Ari Gallus. Hi, uh, thank you, Anne, for the, the wonderful introduction. And Karen, thank you for making it possible that I'm not pushing the wrong buttons in this particular presentation. Uh, you know, sometimes for artists, what happens is that, uh, you know, you, you observe life, you observe nature, you observe things happening around you, and sometimes by serendipity, something that you were not looking for appears. So I'm not going to take you through a whole lifetime and so forth, but just show you a close view of certain things that led to my discovery of this particular process and the years I've spent uh, working on it, delighting in it, and hopefully perfecting it. Okay. Well, I'm going to start at Tyler School of Art, Temple University, where I have been sort of fascinated by luminosity and light. Uh, this me and my good friend, Frank Galushka. I'm the guy closer to the painting uh, at that time with a full head of hair. Uh, this is one of my paintings that I was working on at that time. It's sort of actually inspired by looking at the jet engine while flying. And, uh, uh, you know, it has some kind of erotic connotations to it. It's about eight feet by four feet. And I got accepted to the University of Wisconsin in Madison in 1968. And I continued working on this sort of semi-surrealist um, work or so on, but still involved very much with light. So this is a series of drawings I would do and, you know, pencil, uh, graphite and so forth. And it just, I like the way light bounced back and forth. I like the way your eye shifts uh, focus and depth and your pupils close and open as if when a car comes close to you and the lights are on you don't see the car but the lights turn off all of a sudden it becomes all apparent so i did a whole series of those kind of drawings which led to uh, paintings uh some of them were sort of dreamscapes like this one uh you know but luminosity some kind of uh, dream that i had about uh oh some kind of meteor shower etc that was going in through it and this here, uh, this painting is, is 20 feet by seven feet. It's in sections, it's called the Annunciation. Uh, and it dealt with, obviously the Annunciation that we know from the Bible, but it also dealt with the fact that no matter how a God or whatever has been brought forth and so on, it still had to go through, through the physical aspects of being born out of a woman. And this shows you sort of a scale, how big the piece is. And actually, I was skinny then. Okay. <laughs> and this is some of the paintings. I started shifting into organic shapes uh, using, at that point, a, an airbrush and using uh, basically oysters as inspiration to just avoid my own favorite way of making shapes by having inordinately and expected shapes appear before me and see if I can use them. So you can see that those pieces were quite large. and they slowly, slowly got paler and paler. As you can see the paintings, now the, the paintings behind uh, uh, triangles, which already appeared in 1970 for my master's uh, of fine art show. And those are them. The triangle played a very big point in my life and my art, because that is a shape that doesn't have to be lit from the bottom. It can be lit from the top or from the sides. 
Uh, this is a poster for my Master of Fine Art show. For those of you who have seen this, you should realize it's a joke. <laughs> I rented a cap and gown. I put the bust of Dante in the globe. It sort of reminds me of the pictures of Generalissimus Stalin when I was growing up in Poland. And sort of, you know, people thought of us for real, but I had a blast doing that poster. So I moved to New York City. I later to Madison, New Jersey. And I started, I was sort of inspired by Cy Twombly and my first reflected light pieces. If you look at the bottom of the images, you see the reddish image has like a green tinge and the bluish image has sort of an orangey tinge on it. It was by one day at School of Visual Arts where I was teaching, I walked into a, an exhibition which the drawings were okay. I didn't care that much about them, but the frames made out of uh, highly polished aluminum. And what happened with that is that aluminum was reflecting from the gallery lights, was reflecting upon the wall above the drawings, making it look like if you held a mirror to it and intensifying the white. All of a sudden, I said, this is the answer, reflected light. What people know, uh, you know, whether you, uh, you know, it, what kind of clothing you wear or what, especially my, my favorite artist, Vermeer, uh, knew that light bounces off from one side to the other. Da Vinci did the same thing, realizing that light is not just light, but the color of the object that is giving off the light bouncing on the object that you're painting changes aspects of that particular object. So those are my first canvas works. And of course, the triangle obviously started making. If you look at this, you would see there's some slight, I didn't know how to photograph those works at that time. Uh, so that's why some things really don't, see what they are. And you can see here, this is actually at a current exhibition, how I have it in my uh, transformation exhibition, which is a retrospective currently on at Soka University till uh, May 9th, I think. Anyway, so I started in 72 uh, in my apartment and I couldn't use airbrush or anything else. First of all, I didn't have the power and so forth and the space to use it. So I did a whole thing of triangle paint. This is a description to try to explain to people how that really works. So there'll be a painting with some scan lines and so on on the front of it. The sides we painted partially with a fluorescent paint. And then when it was lit, probably it should have technically exhibited. This I sent out when I was looking for a job. And this is the whole series that I've done. And you know, this is a series of works and they were painted, believe it or not, with a flit gun. A flit gun being one of those things that you used to spray a insect uh, a repellent or not a repellent, but anti-insect spray uh, on the walls, like a little canister that you sort of pump and so forth. And so I did a whole series of those paintings and you cannot see the reflected light here, but it was there. And then I realized something, what I need the canvas for. So I came up with an idea that struck me of making reflected light paintings by using strips of wood. And it took experimentation for me to find out what angle gives you the best reflection of the color, what, uh, what space in between the rods gives you the best intensity of color when reflected. And these simply they're made of wood, they, they, they sat on a wall the way they were. And uh, this series, as you notice, it says fluorescent tape or paint. I've had no money. So therefore my friend, uh, Chick Scroy was able to make me one set of sticks of those uh, wooden sticks, which I would then tape uh, pieces of tape, uh, and tape on it and then photograph it. So here I would graph out, for instance, the work on a graph paper, and then I would tape the tape and there would be the reflected light piece. Another thing I would graph out so I know how many inches to which stick on which side and so forth. And then it become the actual piece that looked like that. And now the reason you have this kind of tiling is I did work as an electron photomicrographer. And you know, I understood what kind of tiling appears in different kinds of uh, molecules and so forth. And so you see, this is a making, making up uh, piece. And this is actual piece. I didn't know how to really photograph them then. This is you're talking about 72 and so on. So you could see how this works. All of those are non-existent because they existed only for the photograph. Then the tape was take the, taken off and the new piece was made. 
And I sent it out to try to get a job teaching someplace else because I lost my job in New York. And of course, uh, as it is, was usually you send up a hundred inquiries about the job. And if somebody answers uh, telling you where to go, you already are very happy because most of them never answered. So you see, this is uh, my first wooden pieces. They were like that, those little square things that you see on the bottom. Uh, when I was working in the summer, I was driving a truck delivery for art the galleries in New York. And I was staying in the summer working uh, with Richard Archfager building up and refer refurbishing his barn and so forth. And I came up with those sticks and so forth and the little pieces. And I knew Ivan Karp, who was the director of the, or the owner, director of the O.K. Harris Gallery in New York. I knew him and he had a house not far. And I came up with this and actually in a milking shed in the barn. And I said to Richard, I said, do I think I should show it to, to Ivan? And Richard looked at my work and he says, you got something there, but why don't you wait to see what those things really do before? And I did. I waited five years before I showed Ivan any of my pieces. And this shows you the, the works that I was doing now when I was living already in Madison. And at that point, it was basically painted with a spray can and someone painted from the back and they were, were hanging up on the wall. What happened, I'm going to go back to this, is that I finally got enough nerve to ask Ivan to see my work. And he wouldn't come to New Jersey, so I asked if I could bring the pieces to Manhattan and show it in his gallery in between exhibitions, which he said, OK. So I took those pieces, each stick individual wrap, that I spent, I don't know, two or three hours actually putting the little brads on the wall so they could be seen. And Ivan was getting very impatient. I finally put them together and I was very tired and very nervous when I said if. It's after all, it was Ivan Karp. And uh, Ivan came into the room. He looked at my pieces hanging on a wall and he goes, blah, 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 blah. and I said, what? And he took out a cigar out of his mouth and he says, breakthrough work. And, and I sort of, I don't know what I did. I sort of must have just fallen to the floor. And but I really tell people that what really happened was that he then made a joke and I didn't laugh. And, and uh, I looked at him, I said, Ivan, don't expect me to laugh because I'm scared shitless. And what happened is that about a month later, I get a telegram that says, call O.K. Harris now. So I call O.K. Harris, Ivan gets on the phone and he says, uh, John Cassidy didn't have enough paintings for his show. Do you have enough paintings for an exhibition? I said, sure as heck I do. And he says, okay, you got the show. And I just loaded my stuff on in the van and I drove to New York and the rest is history. But anyway, uh, what I had to do is I had to build special jigs for it. But I, you know, the first pieces were made of wood and I told Ivan after, if he sells a few pieces, I can take that money and make it die so I can extrude aluminum. And once I got a few pieces sold, I was able to make it die and extrude it with extruder things. And it's a whole long process, not only extruding it and cutting it and so forth, but at the same time, I had to figure out a way to acid bathe it in, in uh, nitric acid or sulfuric acid, excuse me, and to bite holes into the aluminum so the paint would stick and so forth. But this is how I would build the sticks. That I, I like building everything myself. So it took me uh, time to do it. I just noticed I had a beard that was still was red. Uh, and this is a jig and the aluminum pieces are being set into the jig. As you can see, those dowels, I trimmed them to sort of a, a trapezoid shape and I would load them up into the jig. Uh, this, is, oops, this is my friend, Sagan, my Labrador who was always in the studio, but outside of the spray room. This is a piece that's sitting in the jig, ready to be painted. Then I would mask out things I didn't want, and I would paint it exactly at that point with a, a spray can. And this is actually the piece, what it looks like in the gallery. This is sort of a side view, and uh, it was all plotted and, and work done. And what's, up, what's amazing to me about those things is that the separately hanging pieces can be hung on a convex or a concave wall and they still work well and they have to be lit especially. But at the same time, it gives me so many different possibilities of uh, you know, exhibiting the wall or adjusting it to spaces that are available. So I did this piece and this shows you during the exhibition how, how uh, things work. Uh, this is another piece, which is called Half Tumble. And again, you notice that it, it doesn't just happen. It, it has to be organized. I had to figure out 
what the angles are, how many, where the uh, template is going to be, because this is not a circle or whatever. Those are actually made out of separate aluminum pieces that are cut. And there you can see it on the left. You see that piece here. It showed it okay, Harris. And also when I had my uh, first show, uh, Roberta Lieberman, who was uh, director of the Zola Lieberman Gallery in Chicago, came to New York. And I just happened to be there. And she came to my show and uh, got introduced to me. And, and she liked my work. And she asked me if I would like to show in Chicago. Said, well, of course I do. So my show opened up in Chicago and on uh, April. Friday, April the 13th, 1979, where a woman walked in with a friend of mine from high school, a girl I knew from high school. And I looked across the room and I said, it's gonna be my wife. And obviously 42 years later, we're still together, which is really nice. And this is the first piece I did on aluminum with lit much better, it's called Sarah. This is an elliptical shape, a modified ellipse. And just to show you what, it, what the process is, when you're looking at the piece, the background is totally white. And all of this is the reflection of the sides from the sides of the extrusions. I remember during one of the shows that okay, that, okay Harris, a, a person brought in a whole group of people to look at my work and uh, he described it to the people that what I do is I paint very soft colors on the wall and then I paint this, that I hang sticks on it and then I match the colors on the sticks to the soft painting on the wall. And it's just, I was standing, I didn't make myself known that I'm the artist, but I said, but you don't even understand what's going on here. It, it's very difficult for me to explain to people uh, what it is. It, it, it is just ambient light. My paintings change depending what light what day it is, it looks slightly different, different lights, different artificial light changes it and so forth. I remember somebody told me, Arya, if you don't like the painting, how can you show your art? You know, nobody's going to see it. And, uh, you know, my answer was, you're right, you know, light of a mirror or Rembrandt, if you don't have any light on it, you sit in the dark, you're not going to see them either. So it just shows you here that for the ellipse originally came out of the computer printer as, as the guy, the math department to give it to me. And so I cut the pieces the way it's supposed to look like, but they weren't right. It was technically correct, mathematically correct as the ellipse, but artistically it wasn't. So then I actually went and changed some of the lengths of the things to make it look the way that you see it right now. And this is, I had to build special jigs. This is aluminum sitting in a jig that was painted and you see this whole series, again, de dealing with tiling as in the beginning of reflected light, having some flights of fancy, Tiling again. My favorite shapes, triangles. And I did some rectangular works. This was for a show actually was in, in uh, Arizona. And this is a pretty big piece of, I think it's about seven feet across, a sort of Anasazi kind of a thing of inspiration, but still dealing with the tiling. The good thing about tiling is that you change one color in the tiling, the whole painting looks different. So I could make a whole range of almost infinite range of different kind of paint, different kind of colors and images by shift, simply shifting certain colors on a certain area to something that's completely different. And then I started saying, what can I push it through? So I tried to see if this medium will work. And this piece I think is about seven pieces from the flag posters, you know, I want you and I liked it. This is, I, I like this piece for many reasons because it's the first one I tried to do something that wasn't tiling. And the same thing too, I brought the piece to the gallery uh, and I hung it on the wall so Ivan could see it. And I went to the back and talked to a friend who was working there. And when I came out, this guy is there and he wearing a blazer and a gray pants. And he says, I just bought your painting. And uh, it was kind of nice because the thing was up on the wall for, I would say 20 minutes. Uh, never happened again, but it's still a wonderful feeling about it. And uh, there's other stories I could tell, but maybe not this time of what happened afterwards. I did also this poster from Come On, which is a World War I poster, recruiting poster for the US uh, Army or Marines. I'm not sure which one it is. And then this is a pretty big piece. It's also probably about eight feet 
long, so maybe eight by four approximately, uh, or maybe eight by five. I don't remember the size right now. Uh, that was my homage to Monet. You know, his painting Water Lilies, a impression of light, uh, how the colors change it and so forth, how, how he worked it out to create a, an incredible work of beauty. And here was my homage uh, to him, to his art, by making a lily pond, just pure light in itself. It's just a shadow, it's like an anti-shadow. It's the image, the colors are in between the bands of it. And if you look at it, and if you have large enough piece, that means the large enough piece gives you more scan lines, almost like a television set, you know, where you have, uh, so the larger the pieces, the better details I can get into it. And I kept trying different kind of, a, a commission I did. And this is, I did a whole series uh, of uh, American flags for a collector, Charles Allen, uh, Charles Allen Sr. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, what's different about this is that if you're looking at it, sort of unfurled American flag and so forth, and then you see that the white stripes, the, the way I got those stripes to be whiter than a white wall is I actually glued the, the highly polished the mylar pieces to those areas. So actually they were acting like little mirrors that sort of accentuated the whiteness of it beyond the whiteness of the wall. I did a whole series of them. And this here is, uh, It'll come back later in, in my talk today. This is uh, paper pieces, how I designed the paper pieces. If you look down uh, toward the bottom, I don't know if you can see here. Uh, okay, this shows you it's a single piece of paper. It's done flat. The pieces are masked out and the design is painted on the flat pieces. Then the pieces are glued, folded, glued, folded, glued, folded, and so forth. And they create an image which looks like this. This is an American flag too. It's all, it's paper now, but basically the same principle. And yes, you can count the stars and it's a correct number. I did also a series of uh, new works with it uh, to see if I can actually accomplish it. And, uh, you know, mildly posing and uh, I created the rugs actually behind it so different kind of things. And so, so I have different poses and something here. I mean, Wesselman used to do paintings like that and so on, but this is just done with light. I switched, you know, you constantly keep evolving in a certain way and you're changing. So, you know, experiment in, in any kind of medium. I had to know, you know, I still find every time I do a new piece, that it's something new. I still find that it's something completely different that appears to me. But this here, I did try to figure out how can I do a piece that doesn't have to have 58 tags on it, you know, packs that you can hang it on, that you can only use maybe two or three of them. Uh, so I started with this meta series. And this is the introduction of my show, Okay, Harris, that was hanging on a wall, just simply four pieces about, I would say, seven feet long each. Uh, and just, just to get the idea of what happens, that this is a plain white wall and the thing is just reflected on it. Now here's one of the meta series, which is the design aspects of it, the lines going across horizontally work as a design because you know, these are dealing with primary color, you know, yellow, red, blue, uh, purple against the yellow, green against the red, orange against the blue. And they also use, but they are not just a part of the design, but they're a structural aspect holding the whole piece together where it only hangs on two particular packs or nails actually, because it's a pretty big piece. And there's a whole series I did of the meta which dealt with the same basic problem and trying to incorporate. I have so many other pieces, I just couldn't have it photographed. I have a lot of the, my early wooden pieces I haven't photographed yet. Uh, uh, someday I'll do it. Uh, they're, they're still, I still have them anyway. Uh, so you can see that I tried to do, this is going back toward my ellipsis uh, and, but breaking up the ellipse, just like I broke up the rainbow and the three triangles before. And again, using complementary colors and so on. And the crossbars which hold the piece together are actually the support structures. Uh, another one of the same series that's about seven feet tall.
Uh, but I was sort of saying, if I can, I do a target. Yes, a lot of people are painting target, Jasper Johns, etc. cetera. Uh, I want to see if I could actually do it in light. And you see that the top and the bottom, there could be a whole, uh, the bottom rec recreates the color that's, that's in the middle. Uh, uh, you know, uh, my teacher, uh, Victor Cord, was a student of Albers uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, dubbed the interaction of color and so on. So part of it is influenced by that. I'm a product of all of my teachers and whatever else there is uh, in my life experience. But as an artist, I went through different pages. So you can see this here now. And you notice that those pieces now have a frame around it. The reason that I have it, those things framed in the piece with the whole superstructure behind it is because some of the pieces I sold, a guy came to Ivan saying, what did you sell me or whatever? Uh, you know, the pieces don't reflect. So I asked the guy, I said, uh, what color is your wall? And he says, it's navy. I said, it's not going to work on navy. It has to have a white wall. And since most people didn't feel like repainting their rooms, I decided I'll do something else and actually build stretches myself and mount them on those things, which are really not paintings. It's just uh, movable walls with the pieces hanging. It's very heavy, though. Uh, I mean, weight. Uh, this is a pretty large piece uh, that I did from the same uh, series. What's nice about this piece is that after about a week on an exhibition, the gallery director from Okay Harris calls me up and says, Aria, I got good news and I got bad news for you. I said, what's the good news? I said, we just sold your big piece. I said, that's fantastic news. And he says, so what is the bad news? He says, well, the, the person who bought it wants to deliver it to his house in Nice, uh, you know, right away to ship it out. I said to him, uh, what's the bad news? I'll put another five big pieces in the truck and I'll see you in a couple hours. And I did, and he got this piece and I put another piece on. This is what the show looked like. Now, when I started working with Heartland, which is, I sort of found that I really liked landscapes. I like aerial views all the time. And this was sort of almost perfect because it gives you a formalistic aspect of dealing with color, but at the same time, you're dealing with landscape. And I would draw a sketch, you know, while flying cross country or from many times, from New York to Chicago, back and forth. And I would do sketches. So you'd see, I would just look out the window, I see uh, something interesting. Now, if you notice there's two sketches on the right-hand side and so on, they later became a past uh, oil pastel drawing. And the one on the bottom became this, this drawing. And those paintings then led me to a whole series of reflected light landscapes, which is uh, Heartland One. Uh, just the joys of this, some of them are real, some of them, most of them actually are invented landscapes on it. On, and I also use a diagonal on purpose because it does create a much more vital and energized image. Uh, again, I tried to experiment if I can do something that's more realistic. And uh, yes, I could. It's a Monument Valley. I like this piece. This is actually a collection of the New Jersey State Museum. And uh, what I like about it is called Indiana White. And this is flying in the winter from New York to Chicago over Indiana and just looking at how rivers were outlined by the banks of trees filled with trees and the fields were filled with snow. So what you're having here is very simple. It's totally white background and only what, you, what reads as a black and so on. It's actually, I did put colors in there, like a, a warmer purple to the front, a little farther, a little bit more neutral gray and farther bluish colors and so on. But all it is, is that the dark shapes are just the shadow, the realistic shadow would be happening between two extrusions. And the white is actually the accentuated light bouncing off the white parts I didn't paint at all. And it gave me the illusion of flying over a landscape that's frozen. And also, I like oxbows, and you'll see that a little bit later. And I love river and uh, you know uh, winding kind of forms. Uh, another imaginary. So those piece, this piece is about I think 50, 94 by 54, 92 by 54. Uh, it's an imaginary landscape. It's called Illinois Flood, and this is just I imagine what would happen if in a nicely delineated landscape, a river overflowed and how it would look from it. And that's what gives me an excuse to play around with blues and different shapes. Uh, what you see here is an original sketch flying once. I said, what would happen if the 
if the plane was plummeting down. So I jetted this thing down really quickly. And later in my studio worked out a sort of a five point perspective drawing of what it's supposed to look like. And then of course, as I do in most of my things, I did a color pastel uh, version of it. And then from that, using that as a guide and a sort in a certain way, I created a reflected light piece, which is this. This is, I, I don't really remember how big it is, but it's over eight feet, I'm sure. Uh, maybe eight by six or something like that. Uh, I can't remember right now what the size of it is. And you can see how big the piece is, you know? So it's, yeah, it has a probably six feet. Uh, and I did a whole series of those landscapes, playing around with the illusion of what happens if I were to leave the areas white and then paint the other things. So here it looks like clouds are floating over a certain landscape casting shadows, but it's not real. The reality is it's just a flat surface. Uh, it's a phenomena. I, I love the way the brain reacts you know, to, to color. I love the way the brain reacts to clues, even if they're not there. And this one too, it's you know when you're flying over a, a cloud-filled landscape looking through this thing. So again, you get a nice three-dimensional view of the piece, but it's really not. It's just strictly two-dimensional and the white areas, quote unquote clouds, are just areas I didn't bother to paint. Another version of this is called left bank, uh, sort of a word game on the left bank of Paris, but banking left, uh, you know, as the plane is banking left, how the landscape would change. But the reason I did it is because of diagonals. I love diagonals. I love this thing because it makes the picture that much more interesting to me. And here is a, a oil pastel, uh, oil stick uh, painting. Uh, and this was the original version, sort of flying over landscape where the landscape is dark already and the clouds are still catching the last rays of the sun over the horizon. And from that evolved this piece, which is uh, a reflected light piece doing something similar to that. And it shows you how those pieces look like when they were exhibited in the museum. It's black. What happened is in 1993, I stopped all my color work and I started a nine and a half year project in black and white. That was my Kaddish for the victims of the Holocaust, 14 stations, Hey Yud Dalit. And for almost 10 years, I didn't use any color. Everything I did was charcoal. I put my family, I put myself through a heck of a 10 years of dealing with those images. And that's a whole different thing. You can find it uh, at my other lecture about the 14 stations. And then back. I came to Soka and I started working again in color. You notice everything here, things that people say, oh, I mean, you just sit there and you paint and so on. And, uh, you know, artists are not necessarily idiot savants or anything like that. It, everything takes planning. So what I did is I figured out what the dimensions are, what are the stretches dimension, what is the profile, how to build it, what's the aluminum extrusion, how many lengths, where the uh, taps uh, holes are so they can mount on the background. And then oh, it tells you here again, building the actual space, the actual stretches upon which the aluminum pieces go on. And that's, well, first of all, you, when the aluminum is cut, you have to degrease it. And obviously you have to use the chemical gloves and uh, organic vapor mask. That's my wife, Sarah, helping you mount it in the jig. The jig then is put on on a special jig. <laughs> the jig is put on the jig. Uh, which I can go and spray it. I use a car gun to spray the, the Liquitex uh, gesso. Uh, the aluminum is treated in such a way that the gesso actually bites itself into it and locks into the holes of the acid bite created. And then I built the stretches. The outside, the square stretcher is built by my friend, uh, Jeff Simon, upstate New York. And the support bars, as you can see, I actually go and I modify myself. And that's what the wall looks like before it's actually painted. It's just, a, I painted with a roller, just like it was a regular wall. I built and I cut, a, especially in California here, I had to have a earthquake proof things. So I made, uh, I modified some things I could buy in a hardware store 
and I made the brackets, which I then screw on on the wall and the pictures just hang on it. And it shows you uh, the small studies for something and then the large cartoons. The ones on the left are cartoons upon which I base the actual uh, light, reflected light piece. And then I mark it, the, the cartoon is put behind it and I look at it and I mark it a different color on the back spine, I know which side in which to put which color on. And this is a video that shows how I actually do it before, so you don't have to listen to me talk about it. Uh, this particular one, which is called Disco Dash Bolus, which sort of reminds me of a lights in a disco floor from the 70s, although I never went into discos and so on. I was a go go dancer once. Standing now in front of the actual piece, those are the aluminum extrusions, and you see at this stage I already put in the basic lines of where the delineations of the purple are going to be, and I started putting in some of the green. I have a sign on all my walls, it says A equals P cubed, which means art equals perspiration cubed. Now the only thing left to do is for my actually doing it. So, on to work. I'm putting in the second coat of this magenta thing. That's it. Three days of my life, everything is one color, one coat of one, all, all the colors. Now from here, keep going. Well, I guess it's three more times the same thing that I've done up to now, and just certain uh, adjustments and so on that have to happen. But really the last piece, the first coat of all the colors is finished. Hallelujah. Last night at about 11.11, 11, I finished the last of the four coats of paint on this last reflected light piece. You can see how the intensity has changed. When I number the sticks, I number them from the right hand side to the left because they actually you're looking at the back of the work and this is going to be going against the canvas backing. So we have stick number six, 37, 38, 38 for each one of those pieces. Ever since I met her in 1979, I have been putting the following on all of my reflected light pieces. Usually two or three times on each piece. It's the truth. I love Sarah. For the 10 years that I've been working on my Holocaust uh, drawing project, I always kept wanting to go back to my color works. And now that I've finished the last of this new series of reflected light paintings in full intensity color, still somehow I can't escape my previous project. Uh, just working here and looking right through the extrusions, you can see the camp, the concentration camp of Ravensbrück. I have to get back to the present and back to the joys of the color. Now, the last is the varnish. You have to protect it. It's a UV varnish. And protects it. The varnish also changes the color slightly, making it a little bit deeper. This is finished, varnished. Now, the sides here, the colored sides have to be taped over, and then the front has to be uh, painted white. I just have to tape all this stuff out. The amazing thing about this tape, if you leave it on for about an hour, it's fine. You leave it on for a little bit longer, it'll rip the paint off. Now 
taking to beat the spray. That comes the true test. I gotta remove the masking tape and hopefully nothing falls apart. Here we go. Done. I always sweat buckets at this state because sometimes the tape actually can rip off a piece of the paint and I have to rework it. This time on this piece, everything went well. This is Jean Marcus Silva, my assistant for the past few months here. Uh, former student, actually graduated, but for some reason hanging around here <laughs> and helping me out, which is really a beneficial thing. Thank God it happened. Anyway, we're putting together right now the little jig upon which we can place the backing for the painting and actually be able to screw the aluminum extrusions to the painting. So here we go. Let's find if we can do it. It's like putting in a tire, you know. Now it's ready for the extrusions. We did it. I'm going to be removing the extrusions from the jig. It's a rather simple process. All I have to do is Hook the dowel out, wiggle it a little bit here, take it and move it to the actual backing and place it here in the meantime. Good thing John is here, makes the process three times as fast. Time to actually mount the pieces onto the background and Remember, this is 38 pieces times two. Those screws have to be put in, and I used to get blisters for it. So now I'm actually using this glove. So I'm the Michael Jackson of artists, you know. And time to get to work. Those are all stainless steel washers and screws, so they do not rust, and you start mounting it. First, screws I use on the top because that's where I measured from and that gives me a proper alignment to the back all I have to do is tighten up on it just gently tack it in now this is doing the bottom part of it I have to put in the screws a well, good thing that I have a chin to hold it down the piece is finished this is the light from the window just coming in just like so many years ago and now you can see the reflected light piece. Baruch Hashem, the series is finished. What's left right now is to show you how the painting actually goes through metamorphosis from the painted uh, cartoon to the actually reflected light piece. The studio looks kind of empty. The jig behind me is empty. Uh, I am full. I'm full of happiness right now. It's finished. Uh, growing up in Poland after World War II and then Right now, finding myself at Soccer University in California, it's an amazing change of time and place and so forth. Uh, someone would use maybe the light to show the cracks in the universe, whatever else, the little dirty secrets, etc. I try to use the light to show you how beautiful everything is. Nobody owes me anything. The world doesn't owe me anything. I'm teaching painting and drawing, which is what I love. I love painting and drawing. I have a place to work here, I have a place to be happy, uh, and uh, thank you very much for, uh, for being here. You can just see the works and so on, so again, thank you. Good job, Arya. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what I have here is the actual paintings that came from this series. Before this, every <laughs> painting background 
has this. It has a diagram of how to light the piece, what is right, what is wrong, natural light, the light to be from the side, uh, don't, don't, don't bleach out the colors with lighting it straight on like a regular canvas. This goes you again, you remember that sketch I told you for the paper piece? Well, I reused it in a certain different way. It's actually, this is a, the coast of uh, uh, Lake Michigan, sort of north of Chicago. My imagination of it based upon uh, flying over it, but that's what it is. And I made this piece uh, from it. It's, it's actually, I think, seven feet long, but it's uh, maybe uh, two feet tall or something like that. You know, it, 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 I just, just delight me to just be able to change something. The whole series, my, you will see this, and if you look at my website and so on, I, I love Oxbows. It's sort of a, almost a, like Michelangelo's uh, painting to me, of God touching, uh, almost touching the finger of, uh, of Adam and the creation of Adam. And this is like the river slowly, slowly breaking through, through an Oxbow, then creating a, a island before it connects itself. So sort of watching it time Time pass. So it's a, this is actually inspired by flying over the outback in Australia, which is sort of meandering river dried up and so on with little green dots on it from the trees that appeared to it. It's just, you know, my love of the arabesque and the wiggle and the winding and so forth. It's simply formalistic, but I really enjoyed making this particular piece. And you notice that there's a certain theme there that uh, I love the thing. It's not realistic rivers. It's called Red River, but is the river red? No, but it's just an excuse for me to do it that way. And this is actually a, a, a part of a triptych, which was called Fall River. This was uh, three uh, flood, uh, uh, flood scenes, imaginary floods, you know, over a oxbow and so forth, like Fall River, Fall River, Massachusetts, whatever. And then I tried to see if I could actually do sort of an impressionistic piece in my reflected light uh, work. And this came out as a result of it. You notice everything has to be reversed because I actually painted from, from the back. And uh, so the smaller pieces you can tell because there's much less spaces. Some of them are simply just fantasy shape, formalistic aspects. Some of them have more references to actual landscapes and so forth and rivers very formalistic. Actually, this piece is hanging right there behind me. Again, trying to do some pressure. This is combining things and so on, and going back maybe to the original targets and circles. Now, this is a original small sketch for a piece called Winding. And this is a full-size cartoon, which I then make the piece on. And you can see the different sizes, how they are. And this is the actual piece in itself. It's about 74 inches tall of this piece. It actually is in the current exhibition with some of the other pieces besides my other artworks. And this is what you see here. Uh, I'm just, happy to be able to do it. I'm totally delighted to see every time I see it differently, doing different light situations. Sometimes I turn the lights in the gallery off just to see what kind of different glow. And sometimes actually it appears to be more intense when the light is subdued in the gallery and the thing just glows from the windows that are on both sides. You know, and at night then it takes another color. So basically that's what it is. Uh, this is my work. This is what I'm doing. And if you want to have more information, you can go to my website and so far, arigales.com. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, now I hope I can take uh, and ask me questions and so on. Thank you. Okay, here I am. <laughs> I see a whole bunch of you here. Nice to see it. Oh my goodness. Some faces I haven't seen in a while. <laughs> If anybody has questions, feel free to use the hand raising function and we will call on you. I don't see anybody. I see Tom Miller has a question. Tom? Tom, if you can unmute yourself. 
Ari, right, when are you coming back to Madison? To where? To Madison. <laughs> well, probably going to be months away. I mean, you told me just coming back to visit or coming back to work. <laughs> well, coming back to see us. Uh, I hope in a few months I'll be able to do it. And thanks for being love here. Love to have you. Thank you. Good show. Thanks. Questions? I mean, Jeremy? Declan and Harper want to know when they will be mentioned. <laughs> Declan and Harper, they are mentioned right now. That's my sweet grandkids. Where are you guys? I'll get them. Uh, okay. <laughs> You know, one of the one of the amazing joys of this way is that uh, when I got married, I married a woman with two children, and I never changed diapers. So when I was seventy years old, my first grandchild was born, and that was time. I guess the only time I actually changed the diaper at seven. Don't think you ever changed the diaper. <laughs> I don't remember that. Happening. That's my son Jeremy, uh, and he's looking for the kids. Are they here? They're they're in the bathtubs. Sorry. Okay. Everybody. Take Bye. care. <laughs> Any questions, please? I'd really like to answer. Yes. Eve. Eve? You unmute yourself. Unmute. There you go. Not a question, but I just want to say what a wonderful lecture it was. And I saw we saw your artwork with a fresh view, new eyes, and it's just beautiful. We love it. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Anybody else? Hey, I can do a polka or do a Kozatsky. Well, actually I can't do a Kozatsky anymore. I'm too old for that. I used to be able to do it. Any other questions? Mark? Uh, yes. Um, hi, Aria. Good to see you. Hi, Good Mark. job. And, uh, just a, a question. Uh, I've been working uh, with light um, on various satellites, and I'm just wondering if uh, you ever considered looking at uh, doing lights in different parts of the spectrum that we may not be able to see, but have to use special equipment to look at it with. Uh, not really. I have enough trouble with the light that I can see in this way. <laughs> Uh, but no, no, what, what happens is, you know, uh, uh, it's like, you know, some people say, oh, I work like a gum. No, I do not work like a gum. Uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, Steve Antonakos is a friend of mine and there's, uh, who was working with, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, fluorescent, not fluorescent light, uh, neons, neon lights, and there's Flavin, and there's, uh, you know, a couple of other people, Keith Sonier and so forth. And they are working with, with lights that's generated by a power, okay? And I kind of like the fact that my works are generated by simple reflected light without having to use any other contraptions. But I know that you work with rockets and so on. The only thing I can tell you is that I do use uh, uh, Google Earth sometimes to look at see different parts to see if I like any images. So therefore, you might have a piece of mine that has a field from Kansas on an, and the other part of the same painting is a field from North Dakota and someplace from Texas you know, or modified by me. If I didn't like the field that looked uh, facing right side up, I put it upside down. So basically what I use is, uh, no, I'm just going to stick at this point, just to, just to the phenomena of reflection yeah. of the light. Another thought is uh, not just the far distance looking at stuff, but looking at stuff closely. You, you take a uh, ultraviolet light and shine it on a, uh, a flower, or look at the flower in the ultraviolet, the same frequency that bees can look at it. And a plain looking flower has like pointers going to where the honey is mm -hmm. and stuff like that. There's a lot of phenomenology going on that's at all levels, the set, you know, high earth levels to down to the small level. Well, and you might be interested in uh, looking at that and uh, using I, that I, as a. I, a I, observe, I observe evering of that thing. I read about it, I observe everything. And again, 
I don't, you know, I, I try in all my work not to really spoon feed people uh, it just to, for them to discover a certain thing. Just like I said before, the guy looked at my work and described it to about 60 people from Long Island uh, of what my work is while I was standing there and he had it all wrong. It's very <laughs> difficult sometimes to, 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 to see that. But no, I'm, I, I, I really like the phenomenon right now uh, that has just kept it simple and, and allowed the, every day the piece to be a little bit different. You know, sometimes very surprising, especially, you know, uh, you see a piece of a friend of mine has in Chicago and then see one of my pieces here in California and the lighting is being completely different. And I like that phenomenon. Very good. Thank you. Anybody? Jerry? Unmute, unmute. Yeah. Can you unmute? We can't hear you. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. All right. Listen, we're listening to you, and we have oh, one of this. Oh, this is uh, this is uh, Alan. Okay. Yes. Alan Pogren. We have one of your pictures in our living room, and as the seasons pass, the pictures reflect a light that has passed by through the seasons. It's a wonderful illusion. And I'm wondering if that was part of your original design, that, if you want for that to happen. No, definitely part of original design is, a, I would sometimes finish my painting a piece at four o'clock in the morning. I would hang it on the wall in my studio in Madison and I would wait till the sun would come up and watch the day get brighter and watch this light come in and watch the thing change con con you know, constantly. Jerry, you were gonna say something, unmute. There's a button you gotta click on it. You see it says unmute on the bottom there, on the left corner of your screen. That's Jerome Rothenberg, a collaborator of mine, a fantastic poet, great yeah. friend in Diane Rothenberg. Okay, you're on. Just as you are an extraordinarily original artist. There's no one quite like you, Adia. You know, <clears throat> and just to express my great pleasure that in having been able to work with you on on, on, on projects, so I begin to think, you know, how can we possibly collaborate on a light piece? Or... We can. It can be done. Well, well, you know, if it's humanly possible, Jerry, we can do it. Number <laughs> one. And, and thank you for you. Possible. Okay, I go and dunk. Thank you very much for your compliment. You just forgot to say another thing. I'm really good looking <laughs> <laughs> and modest. <laughs> Anybody, please? Any questions? Anybody interests? I think our son is calling on the telephone. Yeah. Okay, then you can just mute yourself and then other people can do it. There you got it. Anybody, please? Okay, uh, I don't know really how. Yes, I hear somebody. You want to say something else? No. Go ahead, Ari. <laughs> okay, uh, all right. So, you know, I tried to present the whole process to you on a scale of one human being having found something, found fascination with something. Uh, being able to express yourself. I, I, I like the fact that people are looking at the work. I like the fact that it's something that, that everybody has a different reaction to it. I like the fact that it can go out in the world and instead of sitting there in the closet and my shining a, a flashlight on it and see it. So I really feel very strongly, oh, I saw somebody on my... Hi, Declan. Hi, Declan. He's... <laughs> It's my grandson. <laughs> that is good. <laughs> All right. Listen, it's good to be a human being. I don't know anything else. That's uh, I haven't chosen to be born into this universe. I didn't chosen my parents. I did choose my friends. I did choose my work. I did choose my relatives, my wife, and so on. My in-laws, my brother-in-laws, sister-in-laws, and so forth. Uh, I, I am really a, a pretty well-fulfilled human being. 
I'm really glad. And I see my friends here. I see Tim, I see you. <laughs> I see people that we have been together since 1968 as graduate students in Wisconsin. Uh, there it is. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's so good to see you. And it's so good to see some of the people that, that I actually can see the images right now, but I just see that you are there. And I really thank you for honoring me by being here for this lecture. Oh, this is my granddaughter, hi. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you all guys. I uh, hope we meet and hope some of them have better, you know, some more contacts with and so forth. So really, I'm delighted that you were here and I'm delighted that you were able to participate in this. So again, thank you very much. And I guess I'm about to leave. Bye-bye, take care. Thank you. Thank you, Bye-bye.